Okay, good morning. It's a pleasure to see so many people after nine days of that camp and several days of that con, especially if they are all still awake. I hope you don't change that. Uh, I don't think I've got any risk in boring these people on this subject matter. <laughs> okay, no more jokes. One of the mo most important documents are our free software guidelines, and he's about to tell us something about them. <coughs> so please welcome Matthew Garrett. Hi, right, so uh, this is strictly uh, down as a birds with feather session. So I'm going to uh, try to go through what I'm going to say reasonably quickly, and then we can all argue viciously over what any of this stuff actually means. Again. Again. So, what are the Debian free software guidelines? Um, strictly, though, this may have been changed to some extent by the general resolution on foundation documents. The Debian free software guidelines are part of the Debian social contract with its users. Uh, they describe what freedoms must be provided by a software license for us to be able to consider it free software. And in terms of the history, um, in 1997, uh, Bruce Perens, uh, who was the Debian project leader at the time, emailed in answer to, uh, somebody posted a software license to a mailing list and Bruce responded with what he considered to be his set of criteria for determining whether or not a license could be considered free software or not. This was later posted to Debian Private as part of his proposed social contract. And there then followed some argumentation on Debian Private and a moderate amount of private emails that aren't archived anywhere. And so as a result, uh, the process by which the Debian Free Software Guidelines, perhaps one of the more important documents in the entire free software community, were written, and the thought process that led to certain wording being adopted, is completely <laughs> hidden from anyone who cares in the slightest, except for Debian developers, and even they can't see most of it. Which is a shame. <coughs> so, here we have a set of criteria for free software. Software must be free to use, software must be free for people to study, software must be free to distribute, and people must be free to modify and distribute their modified software. Uh, this isn't the Debian Free Software Guidelines. Uh, this set of points is the Free Software Foundations for essential freedoms for free software. The Debian Free Software Guidelines are quite similar, but a little more clearly defined. And essentially, what they are are the Free Software Foundations for Freedoms, plus a small list of explicitly acceptable restrictions, such as you may require that the name of software is changed, uh, you may require that modifications only be distributed via patches against the original software rather than as an integral part of the modified <coughs> software. We are more explicit about the fact that freedom must be for everyone. Uh, you can't have a free software license that's free for everyone except employees of uh, nuclear uh, electricity companies or the military. Uh, it must be free even for people who uh, don't like you. And we explicitly state that free software must be able to coexist with the world of proprietary software. It may not need to support it, but it must coexist. Uh, we do not accept as free a software license that states that all other software on the same distribution medium must be free software, because we believe that people should be able to use free software even if they are working in a situation where they're not entirely using free software. And essentially, that's without some of the boasty, the difference between the Debian Free Software Guidelines and the Free Software Foundations for Freedoms. So, 
what I'm going to do now is to look at some of the uh, debate over uh, certain aspects of the free software guidelines. So, for instance, we have Debian Free Software Guideline 8, which states something along the lines of uh, license must not be specific to Debian. The rights associated with the license must apply to everyone who receives the software, not just those who are uh, not just Debian. So this is to prevent uh, licenses such as this, uh, where you have something saying Debian is allowed to treat this as free software, but anyone else who receives it has additional restrictions. And pretty much everyone would agree that this is not free. And this is the sort of thing that's occasionally appeared uh, around the time that the Debian Free Software Guidelines were written. People would say, oh, well, I've written this piece of proprietary software, but I'd point my Debian to be allowed to modify it. And so they'd come along and they'd say, well, here is a license that allows Debian to modify the software, and now surely that's free software because you're allowed to modify it and distribute your modified version. Yep. Can you recall a specific example? Because I can't. Uh, People no, suggest this at various points. It um, was a common response from because we, we would mail. I don't know. If people still do. Um, we would mail the maintainers of people with silly licenses, saying, "Would you care to fix this silly license?" And they would often write back and say, "Well, I don't want to fix for everybody, but especially for you." Right. Okay. And um, there's certain a couple. There's certainly a couple of them that I have successfully found. Uh, I think there's a reference to at least one of them in my paper, okay. which is. Available from Which I should read. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that's obviously something we consider a non-free license. Um, now, the problem with certain interpretations of DFSG8 is that you might end up with uh, a license like this that states that the software is released under the GNU General Public License, which is a free software license, and the Debian project is granted permission to distribute derived works under any license they're choosing, which means that the license grants Debian permissions that it doesn't grant to its other users, which you could then interpret as favor DFSG8. Or five or six. Or five or six, whichever. But we have this issue that certain literal interpretations can have slightly odd side effects, such as saying that a piece of software that grants more freedoms than the new general public license is not free. Which I think, again, people would tend to agree is probably not the desired side effect of this sort of clause. So, one thing that can be important while reading the DFSG is to think about why they were written the way they were. And unfortunately, at the moment, to a large extent, that involves trying to get inside the minds of Bruce Perrins. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, uh, this is possibly slightly less than desirable. We do not, within the project, have any desperately good rationale for why various points in the Debian Free Software Guidelines say the things they do. And a lot of the time we can come up with arguments for why they do say that, but it's difficult to justify some of those interpretations. And some of the question is, should we attempt to interpret, should we take the literal text of the Debian Free Software Guidelines and attempt to interpret that literal text within today's free software social context? Or should we assume that what we mean by free software hasn't changed, in which case we need to interpret them in the situation that we found in 1997, which was a slightly more innocent and less hostile environment uh, in some respects. Less hostile in the sense that we were largely being ignored. Exactly. We didn't have people trying to uh, screw us over and sue us repeatedly, except the University of Washington. Right. <laughs> <coughs> So one thing that's appeared, um, we have this, uh, the GPL is an example of a copyleft license. It's designed to allow it to be, uh, the software to be used by anyone and modified versions distributed and used by anyone. But it's also intended to ensure that anyone using the software can gain access to the source code of the software so they can change how the software they use works. Uh, this is excellent, uh, assuming that you live in a world where software is executed on the computer on your desk. It works less well if you never actually distribute the software that somebody is using to them. So, say if somebody writes an uh, application that sits and presents a uh, web interface to something, 
if the user never actually gets hold of the server side of the software, then under the GPL, they have no rights to the source code, despite the fact that they're using the software on a regular basis. So this is sometimes called the, um, uh, what's the euphemism? Web uh, loophole, or what is it? Remote procedure loophole, something like that. Uh, it's to refer to things where you communicate over a well-defined network interface, a well-defined network interface. And as a result, you can't claim that there's any distribution of the software. Um, I think the, the interestingly, this loophole is, is surprisingly similar to one that's, that doesn't have anything to do with remote communication. <laughs> it's the uh, it's the old argument about the GPL and using wrappers for, um, like for instance, if you use the shell interface to go out and do something, then you're not. If you write a shell script that invokes GPL licensed e command executables then your shell program doesn't have to be under the GPL. Mm. And that's, that's a common interpretation, but it's, it, the, I guess the reasoning is that there's a sufficiently large barrier between the interfaces uh, of the shell and the presumably C, uh, C program that you're executing that the virality of the GPL doesn't hop over yeah. the barrier. It's hard to consider but, that a derived work under copyright law, yeah. though. We'll never really be sure until somebody actually starts a lawsuit over but it. But it's a lot of parsing. It's yeah. a lot of hand uh, So this sort of brings us to the Afro general public license, which is a pretty much a direct copy of the GNU general public license, except with one additional clause. And that additional clause effectively says that if the software released under that license is intended to communicate over the network with the user, and if that software contains functionality that allows the user to download the source code of the program. So say, imagine a PHP script, uh, a PHP content management system that all your web pages are in that has a little button down in the bottom right hand corner that says, download my source code. The Afro General Public License says you are not permitted to remove that functionality. Uh -huh. You may not misremove Mr. Mr. Uh -huh. Oh, sorry, right, <laughs> yes. Uh <laughs> 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 Good thing we don't let you write licenses. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd hope that were I writing licenses, then they would of course be checked thoroughly by Debian Legal before I attempted to release any software. <laughs> so, uh, you could, and they will be unless we get distracted by one of our own internal flame wars. Well, absolutely. So, this is intended to ensure that software, the source code to software, is always available to the users of the software, even if they're separated from that software by the void of IP over AV carrier. <coughs> and I think it's probably reasonable to think of this as a fine upstanding attempt to ensure that uh, the source code of software is available to people who more use. people and the people who use it. On the other hand, it's demonstrably a restriction on modification, and it's a restriction on modification that goes beyond what the GPL allows. I can't take code out of the web server application and stick it into some random piece of crap because it doesn't have a web server in it. Well, at that point, it's not software that's intended to communicate over the network anymore. So it's and not an issue. Or if it uses NNTP instead yeah. of HTTP. And but then you, <laughs> in that case, functionality could possibly be the footer will append a URL that provides the software to it. And, and if, I'm, if I'm correct, you're allowed to change the, the functionality. It doesn't say that you have to maintain the code or the method, just a way to get the... Yeah, I think the idea is that every person who interacts with the software should be able to obtain the source code. Right. So and that that's something that doesn't generally pre present a technological barrier. So, so in that sense, it's a... It's, a um, it's similar to some of the sub-clauses of Section 2, which say, <laughs> if the program is interactive, you must cause to be printed a banner, or you know, you may not remove an existing... Yeah set of code that prints a banner identifying the code in its license or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So you can rewrite it, you, know, you mm. import it to a different programming language, but you have to uh, preserve the existing It's the functionality that's important yes. rather than the specific implementation of the functionality. Right. A another point you might mention about the uh, Affair of Public Licenses, I understand that it was created with the blessing of the Free Software Absolutely. Foundation. 
Um, which has caused a lot of speculation about GPLv3. Well, the Free Software Foundation site explicitly states that it's a non-GPL compatible free software copyleft license, uh, but is expected to be compatible with GPL3. <laughs> and since traditionally uh, GPL3 GPL does not allow any restrictions that's not present in the GPL itself. It right. does it's seem strongly imply. So, so yeah, it's worth pointing out there that it also is, if it provides the functionality, it means that if the software does not include the functionality to 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 someone to download the source code over the network, it doesn't. You don't, right. you, don't have, you don't have to. In that you, don't, sense, you don't have to include it. It's Absolutely. just like the interactive banner clause yeah. in that sense. If it doesn't start out with one, you're not forced to add it when you modify it. Right. Yeah. So it's probably the case that. Even if we accept clauses like this as free, then it's possible that somebody could provide a mechanism that uh, was sufficiently obnoxious that it resulted in you being unable to usefully make the right works of that software. And in that case, that specific software might be non-free. But then we also have people who attempt to interpret certain clauses of the GPL in such a way that it's plainly not really free. I think there are pathological interpretations of most licenses that allow them to be twisted into being non-free software, even if fundamentally we agree that this software should, the uh, basic concept behind this clause should be free. And that's not a problem when the person doing the pathological interpretation is some random Debian developer. It is a problem when the person undertaking that interpretation is the copyright holder in a piece of software yeah. we're trying to distribute. In which case we can always either Just say, not ship so sue it. us, or not ship it. Right. Uh, in general, I think going for the not shipping is probably a better option. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> patents. Um, the patents weren't too much of a problem in 1997 when it came to free software, though they are explicitly listed in, uh, they are explicitly mentioned in the GPL. Uh, which states that it's not permissible for uh, the fact that you can provide somebody with a copyright license uh, doesn't <coughs> mean that you can distribute GPL software if you have a restricted patent license that you're enforcing, which would mean that somebody could not exercise all of their GPL rights. But that's about as far as it went up until fairly recently. And then suddenly people started threatening to sue free software projects over their use of license, uh, patents. And strangely enough, as often happens, the free software community has adapted by uh, including clauses that attempt to prevent this sort of behaviour. Uh, since the behaviour is considered harmful to the free software community, and therefore we don't particularly want people to have the freedom to sue us for patent infringement, for the most part. At least uh, we should make it awkward for them to do so. There should be a cost to uh, suing us for patent infringement. And in existing software licenses, there are two main clauses that deal with this sort of situation. One of them is if you sue us for patent infringement, then your right to uh, where we are the people who give you a piece yes, of software. Yes, so if I, as someone who gave you a piece of software, get sued by you for patent infringement, you no longer have the right to use any patented, uh, any patents that I hold patent for regarding that piece of software. And so I get to countersue you for patent infringements if you want to carry on using the software. Assuming you have a patent to enforce. Yeah. Uh, which... Mm. Yeah. Yes. So, how strong that is depends upon how good a set of patents the free software community holds, and how many of them are implemented by a specific piece of software. But, as an example, that way, it's just like a work for proprietary software, like companies share software, and they, if you sue us, we sue you, because mostly they have patents. Exactly. The problem for us is that we don't have them, we don't want them. In the, uh, proprietary world, uh, companies mostly deal with the patent situation by in hinting at mutually assured destruction. Yeah. 
uh, if Apple and Microsoft got into a patent battle, then it's likely that uh, neither company would be producing a great deal of software for the next 25 years or so. So, Lotus and Borland fought their way to the Supreme Court three times over software patents mm. in the it United States. It doesn't always result in the desired outcome, but effectively, if we don't have any patents, it becomes difficult for us to really uh, survive in this world. But that's sort of very on top of it. The other sort of clause, which is a bit stronger, is that if you sue us for patent infringement, uh, you lose the right to use the software full stop. Which is unfortunate, say, if uh, you're if you're distributing it. Um, it's unfortunate if you integrated it heavily into your own proprietary software. And it's slightly irritating if you've just shipped uh, 200,000 copies of it to your users' desktops. Uh, now, Mozilla includes both of these clauses, effectively. One of them says, uh, the first one here, the patent, one that's strictly related to the patent license, is only invoked, sorry, is invoked if you sue anyone for, if you sue the Mozilla Foundation for any patent infringement, whether it's a specific piece of software or not, uh, then you lose any patent license the Mozilla Foundation has granted you. So if you sue over Thunderbird, then you lose your patents granted by Firefox as well. What if you sue over a business method like like you guys are cleaning your office in the wrong way? Do you, I mean, like no, seriously. in my proprietary <laughs> way, which is good. And I, I, have no, I mean, seriously, it. seriously. I can't actually remember. I believe that the MPL tries to limit it to software type situations. So I can't remember where. Shall we have a a so game and try to get that license parsed before the end of the talk? Uh, whereas the. Termination of the copyright license is only triggered by um, you suing over that specific piece of software. So if I sue you over patent infringement by Firefox, I lose the copyright to Firefox, but not to any other works that I may have obtained. There's a kind of logic to that because the, the penumbra of the copyright protection only goes as far as the work itself, <coughs> whereas patents go everywhere. Yeah. So this sort of clause also appears in the Apple Public Source License. And the Apple Public Source License says, if you sue us for patent infringement, you, uh, we terminate your copyright license to all software that we've given you under this license. So then they jump out of the penumbra and say... Right. Um, the downside, again, is um, the Apple Public Source License uh, doesn't restrict that to software patents. Uh, with the result that if I, say, uh, claim that Apple has violated my patent on their case design, I suddenly lose my rights to use uh, various chunks of APSL software, at least my Apple. Uh, I think that's probably going a bit far, especially since while we will in general agree that software patents do have a somewhat chilling effect upon us, the broader idea of patents, uh, the patenting of hardware designs and the like, is not something that there's anywhere near as much consensus on the evilness of. But for the most part, patent holders often really do want us dead. And so as a result of that, it's not surprising that people within the free software community are seeking to find ways of protecting ourselves from them. The problem is there's no good consensus on which of these things are acceptable in free software and which aren't. Debian's certainly not taking the lead here. The Open Source Institute has explicitly said that uh, they don't really care. And the Free Software Foundation have maintained a wonderful silence. So arguably, this is something where we should be making a stand, but that would actually require us to agree on something. <laughs> Sorry, uh, you just found... I got, uh, according to um, section 1.10.1, the definition of patent claims in the MPL, it's a patent, a patent claim is blah, 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 including without limitation method, process, and apparatus claims in any patent licensable by the grand term license. And the part about termination, it did not further restrict the application of patents. So the Mozilla public license is completely neutral as to regards what kind of patents are involved. Okay. 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 
So, uh, patent licenses, um, complete lack of consensus, and uh, general death of the universe predicted. Unless we actually do something. Steady. I'm sure we can do lots of things, and um, maybe we'll actually do one of them usefully. Let's have multilateral talks with OSI and the FSF. <laughs> you think I we think can get those great. two to sit down? So the FSF, so, so it's worth knowing that the FSF um, is now kind of, their legal department has basically been spun out into the Software Freedom Law Center. Right. And they're employing the person from the public, who started the Public Patent Foundation. Um, and has lots of experience doing stuff with patents. So maybe it's just something we can get an answer from uh, Jan Ravisher. Mm -hmm. so. Over. What's he believes to be acceptable? Yeah, yeah. I mean, most of what public PubPat does is just doing things like storing, you know, basically storing software, software patents for free software, so you can get it so okay. that when the shit hits the fan, right, you can get so it. So we build say, up our own arsenal. <clears throat> they can say, listen, we've got ten patents and they're fucking useful, and you need them, and right. you, and we're gonna have to make. Yeah, a deal we've got a patent on XOR, so pay up. Right. Mm -hmm. Or well, actually, leave us alone is the stance we've adopted. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, trademark licenses. Um, class A. <laughs> this has come before with Firefox lately. The Mozilla Foundation holds a trademark on Firefox as related to uh, the field of software products. Uh, in the United States, at least, possibly in some other jurisdictions. For that matter, they hold a trademark on the word Mozilla as well. Uh, but yeah. it's not clear to me what the scope of that one is. So, the idea of this is to say, if you modify this software, uh, you are not granted a trademark license, and so if you continue to call this Firefox, we can uh, send you cease and desist letters. And the idea of this is to prevent situations where people impair <coughs> a brand by taking advantage of the freedoms granted by a free software license. The specific source of concern that the Firefox people worry about is that anyone can take the Firefox source code and integrate spyware into it, and then put it up on a download site as Firefox. Right. And they would prefer fire versions of Firefox that do bad things to not be called Firefox, because otherwise <laughs> you'll have people... Setting the home page to goat sex. <laughs> For instance, uh, that's not... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't. So the idea is not to prevent somebody doing this, because obviously there are cases where there might well be, a, or say, um, if I'm doing a study into uh, user behavior when using web browsers, that would make sense my modified web browser to track what people are doing while they're using it. Uh, but that's great in the scientific setting. Uh, it's not really possible to prevent it in a free software license. <coughs> right now. People need yeah. to have the rights to modify software in that ways. That would be a field of endeavor restriction. Yeah, people need to have the right to use software, uh, to modify software to do things that you didn't expect them to do, and may even not particularly like them doing. So the idea of this sort of trademark license is not to prevent people taking advantage of the reasons granted by software, it's to ensure that the user can always tell the difference between a product that's upstream produce and a product that downstream produce that is derived work of the original. And there's been some <coughs> argument over whether or not this should be acceptable in free software. I tend towards thinking that it's a bit irritating. Um, but in a situation where we can provide software given a specific name, given the same name as upstream, then that reduces user confusion. Um, is probably a worthwhile goal because it doesn't actually prevent the user from modifying that version themselves, providing it is not too difficult to rename the piece of software. No. Yeah, so the Mozilla Foundation in this case have effectively said that they will provide a set of instructions, and if you do everything <coughs> requested by those instructions, then that will be considered uh, sufficient to satisfy their concerns. They won't sue you over any remaining instances of the word Firefox. Uh, that, to make sure I understand correctly, uh, there's, it's an old, even from the old days, it was like you go to Washington has these clauses that you, you need to, to, uh, to make it, to change the names. 
but this is extending is you cannot even use the name. Is that correct? You cannot. So um, Rep represent your work as the, uh, the pine license, for instance, requires locally modified versions to carry a version number that was different to make it clear that it was a locally modified version. That was perhaps in that case more e support burden. So if somebody reports a bug to the University of Washington with the version number, they can immediately say this version has been locally modified. So <laughs> this goes a bit further in that it says you can't use the name, but it's only bounded by trademark law. You can use the name in any way that is not confusing, confusing that does not infringe the trademark license. So the fact that I am not allowed to call it Firefox does not mean that I am prohibited from saying we've built this software on top of Firefox in an interview with the press. That's in the same way that uh, the fact that Ford holds a trademark on the word Ford doesn't mean that I can say that I used to own a Ford. So it's just to clarify actually what, what trademark is about. What, what, Sorry? So so what they are saying is this that it is that's the standard of trademark, isn't it? Uh, the default state is that uh, you are not permitted to use a trademark term. Yeah. Most uh, a trademark term in areas that would be confusing this way. That's not generally an issue with free software because very few pieces of free software use trademark terms. It's worth pointing out that Debian is a registered trademark. Yeah. Debian is a registered trademark. You are not permitted to uh, call something Debian in various cases. Uh, in some other cases, I believe. You're allowed to use the Debian trademark where it relates to Debian, so there's some arguments okay. where the derived things. But descriptive, you can't, you can't necessarily, and as non-profit, and there's a number of other things. A number of people do use the word Debian in places where they probably shouldn't, and you know, and software developer can just has a lawyer who goes around and tells mm -hmm. them to stop it. Since there was the case of the, um, uh, what was this, trusted Debian. Yes, yes. That was didn't necessarily present a very flattering image of Debian by implying that the default <laughs> yeah, was untrusted. Untrustworthy Debian. Yeah. And so I don't think we actually instigated any sort of formal proceedings, but it was suggested that maybe they might want to reconsider their name. Yeah. And I think it's the DPL at the time who sent them a NASA yeah. gram and that and they changed. Was yeah. it Ben um, Collins? Who was I think it was Martin McMahon. Uh, and <clears throat> they changed without any argument. It's, uh, they still about it. Oh, well, okay. They changed without too much open argument and unwillingness <laughs> and have sort of begrudged it ever since. Yeah. Um, is Jeff Lequia in here? If not, okay. Um, we, we kind of fought our way to a, um, a kind of principle on Debian Legal with regards to the LaTeX Project Public License. Because what they wanted to do was enforce a restriction wherein if you modified a file, you had to change the file name. And we fought that pretty strongly and did actually get their agreement uh, not to, to try to push that into the license. Because the reasoning is, is that this is, a, is that you can use trademarks or things like trademarks to prevent people from passing off a work as something that it's not. Mm -hmm. But you can't use it to... Uh, to impose restrictions on modifications of computer interfaces. <coughs> and a file name is a computer interface. Yes. So uh, I think we would have a problem if the Mozilla Foundation were very strong about saying you can't call, you like, user bin Firefox is not allowed. Mm -hmm. You could call it user bin Firefox, and then when it comes up, it says, you know, Debian Ice Weasel. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and the banner. Uh, if because, the because then you're communicating directly with the user, more or less, mm -hmm. and not trying to communicate with another software interface. And that's an important distinction to keep in mind. And I think it's one that has rough consensus on the Debian legal mailing list, yeah. at least as of a year or so ago. Um, again, the Mozilla Foundation uh, suggested that they don't object to, say, binaries having right. that name. Uh, as long as in the obvious user interface it's not referred to that way. So in the right. graphical environments, they would prefer it to appear with the ice weasel term rather than the Firefox term in the menu. Right. But that's when launched. Uh, uh, if being launched by other software, that other software would be allowed to launch it by attempting to call Firefox. Right. So it presents the same software interface, but not necessarily the same direct interface to the user. There, there has been at least one court case in the United States where somebody was used, was embedding their trademark term inside a BIOS or something. And so when somebody was uh, creating a clone, 
the presence of the trademark term in the BIOS was, was used as an instance of infringement. I wish I could find the case for this. I've looked for it at some point within the past month. Um, but the court ruled that because the presence of that string was used by other software mm -hmm. to configure itself, and the purpose of copying the trademark term was to provide interface compatibility, that the trademark licensor could not initiate uh, trademark infringement proceedings. So it's, it can be dangerous to a trademark holder to wed the use of their mark too tightly with technological dependencies upon that. I believe that case may actually have been over the Nintendo Entertainment System, um, people producing unlicensed cartridges for that. Possible, yeah. Uh, Sony did something similar with the copy protection for PlayStation. There's a section of code on PlayStation CDs that is copyrighted and represents their trademark mm -hmm. in some way, so they can attempt to use as many cease and desist letters as possible yes. if they're not all enforceable. Yes. Even more so, in fact, um, but part of my day job, I was asked to get, to get involved with such a case. Apparently, the PlayStation will not start up unless it finds certain PlayStation graphics on the CD. And of course, they're copyrighted and trademarked and everything, all the graphics. Yeah, so uh, people have tried to use trademarks to inhibit uh, people's ability to make interoperability works and yeah. interoperability. Uh, I think. People attempting to do that are probably not on the side of free software. <laughs> <laughs> you think? <laughs> I think we may have some reasonable degree of consensus there. So, since 1997, the world has changed somewhat. Uh, we have many more things that are being used to attack free software. We have people who will deliberately attempt to use every loophole they can to take advantage of what we have written without giving anything back. And that's fine uh, in some cases. Uh, obviously, the BSD license specifically is written in such a way to encourage this sort of behavior. But there are other licenses uh, that are used by people who would prefer this sort of thing not to be allowed. And inevitably, when we try to protect ourselves from more of this sort of behavior, we impair the ability of people to make certain types of derived works or to use the software in certain cases. And we need to accept that there is a balance here. It's always possible for people to come up with new ways of attacking free software, and if we want to protect against those, then we may need to prevent people from being allowed to do certain things that would in an ideal world to be allowed. So the GPL is an obvious example of something that very much restricts the rights of derived of derivers uh, in order to protect the community as a whole. It says you may not embed this software within software if you're not going to read the source code of all of this under the GPL. And if, say, we imagine a hypothetical world where the GPL had not been written in the late 80s. If uh, in 1997 uh, Debian was based almost primarily on top of BSD licensed software, if the Linux kernel, in fact, were under a BSD style license. And then we've got to this point, and somebody came along with this copyleft license. Uh, maybe it wouldn't have been written to store, uh, perhaps, but I don't know, things would have worked out differently. And so if somebody today presented the GPL to Debian as a new software license, of the likes of which had never been seen before, do you think there's any remote chance whatsoever that we would look at that and say, yes, this is a free software license? Mm, I think we would make them get rid of some of the balls in section two about the banners that we have to keep. Uh, uh, to be honest, I think we'd be strictly quite dubious about this idea of uh, imposing uh, source code availability. Who's we? Well, <laughs> we, we various be, people within Debian. We wouldn't Debian. be here in the first place. Yeah. It's unlikely that we would have been successful enough to be here in the first place. Because we'd all be running Microsoft Linux. Yeah, and that sort of thing. <laughs> so it's been something of a problem, but the instinctive response to any new license is to look at ways as it restricts freedoms beyond what we consider acceptable without looking at what benefits those restrictions bring. And possibly the time has come to actually start thinking more strongly about where we think the line should be drawn in terms of the balance between 
restrictions and freedoms. So that's basically everything I have to say. Uh, is there anything anyone else would like to bring up? Just stretching more. Okay. No, I'm not sure. Um, one thing, one thing that has really uh, kind of hidden for me is in a lot of conversations with with Evan Mullen, he'll always say things. I'll say, well, you know, this part is really annoying and it causes this to happen and all these things. Says, is this a freedom issue? And you have to think about it, right? Because I think that that often, often we confuse the less than optimal situations or the plain ugly or confusing situations or the you know, any number of different problems that a license can have. And there are lots of problems that a license can have that, that are not necessarily freedom issues, right? There can be, there can be sub licenses that are suboptimals in a range of ways that, that ultimately do not take away anybody's freedom or put it, I don't know, against the spirit of free software. And I think that that's something we need to kind of ask ourselves every time we go so basically. <laughs> Free software is not the freedom to do absolutely anything. Free software is the freedom to do some things, uh, maybe a large number of things, mm -hmm. but not necessarily everything. Well, let me rebut Mako's point a little bit. I, the concern I have with licenses that are written like shit, uh, it, it, even if in, only in some respects, is that, is, is that we have to remember what's the goal. The goal here is that we want to have freedoms, and we want to have those essential for, uh, free software freedoms. And if you have a license that's, that's full of ambiguous or unclear language, what does a careful person who's trying to do the right thing when they're modifying free software do? They read this and go, hmm, can I do this or not? Will I get sued? Uh, it's not really clear. I might have to pay a lawyer. And they just won't exercise their freedoms. Even, even the ones in the subset, I mean, not the freedom to do absolutely everything, but even the freedoms that they're supposed to be guaranteed under the FDL. So, it, you know, I, I, want to, I want to do better than having a, a world of licenses that are technically DFSG free. I want to have a world of licenses where people can go forth and exercise their freedoms with some confidence that they're not going to be squished by you know, uh, some lawsuit because that, that threat is real and they're going to have to cope with that on a rational basis anyway. Um, if license proliferation and the proliferation of poorly worded licenses increases to the point where they, you know, are, are, are smothered by irrational fears, uh, then we're not really servicing the community. Have you talked to real corporate lawyers about the GPL? I have not. <laughs> They're incredibly terrified of it. Well, many of the crap ones are. And the problem is that you can tell people that their fears are irrational, but they're irrational, and the reason that they have these fears is because they're not thinking clearly, and very often, you coming along and trying to, you know, explain it to them isn't going to help. Yeah, yeah but, but who, who, is more, who is more likely to make a persuasive case? Joe Q, garage developer, or the Debian project? I mean, ten years ago, we were Joe Q, uh, garage developer. Now we have a little more force, we have a stronger voice, and we know other people in the community who can help to make a persuasive case. Let me give you a good example. The Creative Commons people have been pretty, pretty <coughs> indulgent of our, you know, nitpicky proofreading of their licenses, and it looks like that they're going if to be. The right licenses are very, you know, favorable to us, but the people that you not consistently, but more, you know, most of them, you know, we're interested in talking to. Um, Compare that with the people who are scared mm -hmm. and don't understand what's going on. Those people are all, those people are already the people who aren't connected to our community, and they've never heard of us. Or if they have heard of us, they see us as some kind of weird hippie crowd. Right. And, yeah, and some, part of, some of that group are the judges and the lawyers. Mm -hmm. So sure. you, you turn up to a UK court and you go to the GPL. They'll go, well, this phrase doesn't mean anything because the right work has no meaning in English work. Uh, I think it's clearly the case that proliferation of software licenses um, does nothing whatsoever in most cases benefit free software. Right. And the open source institute must they actually OSI. Initiative. 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 Yeah. Have actually started taking a stance against this, which is a surprisingly useful thing for them to have done because I like, can't remember doing anything <laughs> Related, else. Related, but welcome nevertheless. <laughs> yes. And 
that, I think, is undoubtedly a good thing, because, okay, we don't particularly care about what the OSI does, but uh, lots of companies really want to be able to take that little OSI approved license tick box when they're saying, so are we going to be able to say that we're engaged in open source? So one of the things that I think is really interesting is when we look at the body of licenses that existed back when the DFSG was written, it was pretty easy to determine which within that set were ones that we thought yeah. fell on our side of the line, which ones we thought fell on the mm. other side of our line. Yeah. And in fact, the set that's explicitly referenced in our clause foundation 10, yeah. in clause 10 was not particularly arbitrary. It was, in fact, at the time, you know, almost the complete list of licenses that we thought were reasonable at that time. Okay. And what's been intriguing to me is that there's this combination of, of, of effects and pressures that over time have caused new licenses to appear. There's really only been one sort of economic model change in licensing since then that was at all interesting to the free software community, and that's the difference in set of rights that the Mozilla license injected. Other than that, in, in almost every case, what we have seen is a proliferation of licensing subtleties that have made it harder and harder for us to figure out which side of the line the license falls So just blaming Debian Legal for getting more argumentative doesn't doesn't paint a complete picture. The, the, the market has evolved to the point where we're being asked to make more and more difficult decisions. Yeah, where the, 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 the issues at hand are more subtle and harder for the average on the degree of software professional to, to come around. That's, that's why, I, that's just one of the reasons I wish people would cut legal some slack, well, the, the, because the, it's being asked to do harder and harder things all the time. The reason for this is obvious, though, is because nowadays, getting your license approved by Debian or OSI or whatever as free software, has while has, has a lot of value, even if your license is not really free software or you don't really care about free software or anything yeah. like that. And so lots of people are very motivated to screw everybody over. Yeah. And this is one reason why new licenses are, you know, treated with a great deal of suspicion. But on the other hand, you look at these licenses, and the problem in most cases, with you know, if we're not talking about giant weird shit licenses from Microsoft um, or Sun, um, <laughs> or often, Apple. yeah, or Apple. But sometimes we, you know, we've got some random project out there, and they wrote some of nonsense, and, or they, they, you know, with the best of intentions, and what those people need is, you know, help. And Friendly guidance, yeah. <laughs> I think at this point we're out of time, so um, I'm sure we'll have ample opportunities to continue this discussion at length in a variety of different ways. So, thanks. Well, I should point out that what, what, when I was DPL, I tried to get people to agree to a recodification.